All right. Hey, students, welcome to another episode with Mark and Matt. Of course, I'm Matt. And uh, yeah, thank all of you guys, especially our students at ULC, um, all of our followers on YouTube and LinkedIn and all those other socials, Instagram and TikTok and all those things. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys do like our channel or like this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and of course, share because uh, sharing is caring. On today's episode, you can see that is not Mark. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, Abe Shah, or as I call him, Abs. Um, and Abs is what they call a jack of all trades. And I'm sure you'll see why uh, by the end of this show. So let's get to it. Um, Abs, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, Matt, thanks for inviting me. It's um, a, re a real pleasure to be on the show. If somewhat nerve wracking experience uh, being on a ULC podcast for the first time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, all three viewers are really going to, uh, you know, really going to rip into you for that. So don't worry. <laughs> It'll be fun. Okay, good. All right. So question number one. So I guess, uh, obviously, let's start with an origin story. Uh, give me a little bit about your background. And then uh, more importantly, you know, as this is a teaching podcast, uh, what, what got you into teaching? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, so my background actually is in engineering. So many years ago, I used to work as a contractor uh, for the oil majors, but I, I found the work uh, not really fulfilling and satisfying. So I decided to switch careers. Um, so I ended up working as a project manager uh, during the launch of digital TV. Then I worked as a while uh, for a while as a journalist. Um, then, then sometime later, um, I was actually in India backpacking when I took some time off my career. And I was backpacking and uh, I was in, um, in South India, um, swimming in the Arabian Sea. And a whole bunch of garbage uh, floated in on this idyllic beach in the south of India. And I thought, wow, that's, um, that, that's really not cool. Um, but anyway, it, it kind of left an impression on me that someone could pollute the seas in the way that they did. Um, sometime later, I was offered a job for a, a large multinational. And the job involved uh, working on sea pollution. So it was quite um, funny how that worked out. Um, that a few months before, I was swimming in the sea and I witnessed pollution. And I thought someone should do something about this. And then a few months later, I was offered a job for a large uh, multinational, as I mentioned, in, in London at their headquarters, um, working on the very thing, so working on sea pollution. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of a little bit about my background. In terms of how I got involved in teaching English, so um, throughout my career, particularly in the, the, the last um, MNC that I worked for, uh, one of the things I noticed was, uh, one of the things I noticed about problems at work <laughs> related to communication. Um, so, whether they were projects, um, whether the head office is communicating with um, the regions where you have multinationals working in throughout the regions, uh, communication has always been a problem. Um, so throughout my career, I've kind of focused on making sure that when I write and other people write, that it's, it can be understood by a multinational audience. And what I found through that was that um, all the projects that I worked on were a success. So I've witnessed um, projects failing and costing companies millions of dollars in, in failed projects. Um, so what I discovered through this was that, you know, language can make such a big difference um, to the effectiveness of a company, but also it, it helps people feel included in a multinational environment. Nice, cool. So I guess you could say that you, your teaching career began before you started teaching. Because you were teaching at, you know, you were teaching your team how to communicate better um, as a trainer, uh, something like that. Yeah, so I, I kind of um, skipped over a few parts of my career. Um, so um, just before I got a job with this multinational, whose name I won't mention right now, but I worked, okay. there, I worked there for 20 years. Um, just prior to that, I, I worked as a journalist for a year. So 
um, as working on for a, for a global Asian publication. Um, so that, of course, gave me my first kind of foothold in communication, if you like. Um, and then after that, I actually spent a year teaching in London, in Oxford Street, oh. for an uh, English language school. And that was pretty cool. But at the time, it wasn't kind of really um, giving me the fulfillment that I needed. So as I mentioned, um, I took a year off. I wasn't quite sure what to do. I saw this pollution incident. I thought, I want to do something about that. And then I came back to London, and I was offered a job, as I mentioned, in, in the very thing that I wanted to do. So that was kind of my um, for foray into communication. So starting with a, as a journalist, then teaching, um, and, and then joining this company. Um, and it was quite interesting. When I joined this company, we had a new chairman. And we're talking about a, you know, a billion-dollar turnover business. Um, so it was not small. And it had something like 140 offices worldwide. But I remember the new, the, when the chairman came in, the company was leaking something in the order of about $20 million a month. It was leaking. And it was interesting because he was addressing all the staff in the head office, and there was about 400 of us. And the one, and I made some notes. And the one thing that came through was communication. Just it, it seemed to be the common denominator. It seemed to be the problem. And it, and um, I keep using this phrase. It was funny, uh, but it was because you know as I went through my career at this organisation, and you know incidentally I ended up in uh, global and uh, regional roles, very senior roles. Um, communication was always a problem. So I worked on a, a project uh, a couple of years ago. It was a large um, uh, 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 IT system, SAP, SAP. I'm not sure how many people are familiar. Um, and this system had been rolled out in other regions. Um, so I, I travelled to Germany and other places just to see what, what you know what, what worked well and what didn't work well. And what I discovered um, on the whole. Uh, was that communication was one of the key reasons why the projects were failing in the other regions. So people just weren't um, communicating clearly uh, in their emails and, and whatever forms they used. Uh, so just, just to kind of um, um, uh, shine a light on that, um, so, you know, you'd think that native English speakers communicate clearly, but, but they don't. And, and it's a real problem. So I was in, I, I was in Singapore, I still am, I was in Singapore, uh, responsible for uh, overseeing uh, the rollout of this project from a change management perspective. Mm, and I used to receive emails from head office, from native English speakers, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't have a clue what they actually wanted me to do. I had no idea. So I used to uh, wait till eight o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, UK time, and I'd phone them or email them and just to understand, look, what do you actually want from me? Um, and then when I clearly understood what they wanted, I'd then draft my own email to the region. And bearing in mind there's 26 countries, 13 time zones, and a variety of uh, cultures and English um, speaking levels. So I used to um, tailor that communication to an audience that so everyone understood what I meant, no matter how um, high or low their English level. And again, I'll be honest, uh, during that whole project, a very difficult project, um, I never received one email asking for clarity. So, nice. that's, so that, that's how important clear communication is. Nice. That's awesome. Um, so you mentioned change management, so I'll mm. segue into change whisperer. Of course, you're not only an English teacher, you are also the owner of change whisperer. Um, so tell us about that and what, what do you do there? What's your, what's your main goal with that business? Yeah, so, yeah, sure. Um, I, you use the term English teacher and that, that's true. You know, I do teach English and I do um, stuff out of books that all teachers do. But I kind of consider, consider myself more an English coach because what I do is, sure, I, I teach English, but it's within the context of a business environment. So, um, so the company I have, you mentioned Change Whisperer. So we, we've got a number of different services, and the, the key service is change management. So helping companies through large change. So whether they're changing their organisation, 
uh, introducing new IT systems, we help with that. One of my service lines is uh, business communication. Um, so this is about um, helping companies and their workers to be clearer in their language within the company. So companies spend a lot of money on external communications and they're very polished uh, and very cool. They also spend a lot of money on internal communications, which is communications from the top level management through the organization. But there's a gap on um, clear communications between departments, between people, interpersonal communication. So that's the gap that I fill. So um, working at ULC, this is give a perfect opportunity. So you, ULC, you have a ready-made clientele. You're already working with international companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, etc. Um, so this is a great opportunity to um, combine English language with professional skills training. And we've called it English for Professionals. So while the English for Professionals service is targeted at non-native English speakers um, to help them uh, communicate better in a multinational environment, um, but also to teach them skills, so skills they don't ordinarily receive, whether that's in project management, change management, managing people, a whole a bunch of things. This helps with that, but actually it's not just non-native speakers because even native speakers, they, they don't understand the difficulties that non-native speakers have. So for right. example, they'll be speaking to a non-native speaker and before that person's had an opportunity to answer and they're still translating, they'll ask another question and another question. And it's really confusing for non-native speakers. So the, the idea of this service, which fits into my Change Whisperer company, is to, is to fix that piece. It's gone on too long. So it's to, A, um, upskill non-native speakers in both language and professional skills, but also educate native speakers in communicating with an um, international crowd. Nice. I, you know, I, lo I love that. And I think that's, that's so true of, of, of native speakers and non-native speakers communicating. I think a lot of our students, you know, think it's their fault that they're not being understood. But I think a, a lot of the times it's also the person who's listening and that, that person could be a native speaker. So I, 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 I totally agree with you. I think that's a service that is um, definitely needed uh, in, the, in the working world, especially in Singapore, you know, these countries that are um, you know, thriving on multinational businesses with, with, uh, with, with employees from all over the world. So that brings me to my next question. Do you have a specific experience in which you helped a student with, you know, manage their communication better or a specific experience where they were able to uh, succeed by communicating more effectively? Yeah, I mean... I'm teaching people every day from a range of industries, from finance industry to um, semiconductors, etc., even retail stores. Um, a great example I've got um, is a student from a, a Japanese bank, and uh, he was having real trou trouble with email. So it's a heavy, heavily regulated industry, and he was required to send an email to the hundred or so staff in the Singapore office and he needed a 100% response rate from, from the employees. So he'd send an email and you know, um, he'd get around a 10, 20% response rate first time around. So then he'd send another email reminding them to respond and maybe he'd get another 10, 20%. This thing went on for a month, sometimes more. And, it, you know, and he was spending a lot of time and effort just, we call it chasing people for a response. Um, and it's wasted effort. Um, so I did a class with him, uh, remember clearly, it was on a Thursday night, um, and we just worked around the structure of the email, the tone that he uses, and just simplifying some of the language that he used as well. And it was interesting because he sent that less, the, the same email that he would normally send, but restructured in the way that I advised him to. He sent it on Friday morning. By Monday, which is when he had the next class, he was up to around 50% response rate. So he's jumped from 10, 20% to 50. By that Oof. Thursday, he had had an 80% response rate. And now he's up to about 98, 99%. You have the odd person off work or, or whatever. So yeah, that's a classic example of, you know, P 
people send or receive around 100 plus emails a day. Um, if you're not if you're not spending that time on emails efficiently, it can, it can use up all your time at work and you don't have time to think about other things. By helping him be more efficient in the way that he used emails, it gave him time to spend on things he really likes doing. Um, so yeah, that's a good example. And um, actually he also got a, a compliment from his head office on his new email structure and other people in his company have started using that email structure. So it, it has a domino effect within it. Nice. Well, yeah, that's yeah, that's amazing. If that's if that's a success story, uh, yeah, I mean, abs teacher abs teaching you how to how to write emails. That's amazing. Um, all right, so I think we're kind of getting getting to the end of it, um, and I think you've answered a few of my questions already. So that's awesome. Um, but the last question is, what I guess, what advice would you give to that student who is, you know, either listening to this or or watching this? And, and they feel like they're struggling with English at work, uh, what advice would you give to them? Well, the first thing I'd say is you're not on your own. <laughs> you're not alone in feeling that. And I'll be honest, um, you know, even English um, speakers struggle with writing clear English. Um, of course, the advice I would give is um, come to, or, or take, take a class in English, of course. That, that's, that, that's my advice, my number one advice. Uh, um, and I think that is my advice. Um, come, okay. come, come to a you know um, English for professionals um, class stroke course. You know, I help with um, all the things that I mentioned earlier, whether it's change management, project management. The great thing about this course uh, and this learning is um, it helps you with confidence in the workplace. So I've had students come into my lessons and their confidence is low. Um, I teach them structure, I teach them theory, and more importantly, I get them to practice in role play environments. And, they, and it gives them the confidence to then perform in their daily lives. Great, yeah, I, I, of course, you know, I love that word confidence. I think that's, that's a big hindrance for a lot of our students is I think, you know, I just taught a class um, and all three of them were in upper intermediate and they were all like, oh, my English is no good. And I was like, you're in the second highest level, so you guys are great, and you know, just be confident. And I think once they kind of make that mental switch of maybe thinking that they could be better or they are better, uh, they they will be better. But um, I agree with you. Obviously, uh, if if you are a student and you are struggling with uh, with your English at work, give us a call or send us a message or comment below. Um, abs Abs or myself will be will be more than happy to to help you out with that. So. Um, Abs, any last words? Um, I, whoever's listening to this podcast, uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, Matt, thanks for this opportunity as well. And, uh, and I just wish everyone you know, all the success in their English journey. Nice. All right. So we'll wrap it up there. So again, if, if you got to this point, you're still listening uh, and you like this video or like this podcast, obviously click like, click subscribe, find us on you know, find teacher Mark and I on uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, all those other fun places. So there we go. Thanks again for watching, and uh, we'll see you in the next uh, next interview. Bye.